On most days of the week, George R. R. Martin gets up, has some coffee, sits down at his desk to work, writing fiction. And the whole world of Westeros stirs to life in his head. It's a world where a decade-long summer is coming to an end, and things are getting darker and crueler all the time. There are dragons, white walkers, old gods and new gods. There's a gigantic looming wall of ice. There's blood, sex and magic. Most of the characters in his fiction are brutal opportunists. And the best characters are people who are broken in some way, and that brokenness makes them compassionate, almost against their will. But the times are so bad in Westeros, they have to conceal their feelings carefully. The five books so far are collected under the title A Song of Ice and Fire. The books have millions, millions of obsessive fans who can't wait to find out what happens next. Because George keeps surprising us. He keeps shocking us. He doesn't hold to that tired, clapped-out Hollywood template of the hero's journey. If you come to like or love a character, you can have absolutely no confidence that he or she will survive the times that they live in. The first book of his series was called Game of Thrones, which gave its name to the HBO TV series, and it's become an international phenomenon. And George is in Australia as a guest of the pop culture festival Supernova. Uh, before we start, spoiler alert, if we start talking about the Red Wedding and you don't know what that means, please block your ears. George R. R. Martin, <laughs> welcome to you, sir. Well, thank you. I'm very glad to be here. It's, like, it's nice to be back in Australia. Lovely to have you here, sir. Uh, what was going on in your life when the first glimpses of this vast, complicated, interconnected, teeming world of Westeros popped into your head? Well, it was uh, 1991, actually, which is frightening to realize how long I've been writing these books. Um, at that time uh, of my life and career, I was working a lot in Hollywood, um, television shows, movies, pilots, but I had no... Uh, no particular assignments that summer, uh, the summer of 1991, so I had decided uh, while my agent was trying to set up some meetings for me to pitch some pilot ideas, I would uh, write a novel that I'd been planning for some time. It had been like four or five years since I'd done my last uh, novel. So I started this science fiction novel that I'd been planning for quite a while. And I was about 30, 40 pages into it. It was going pretty well when suddenly one day this, this uh, first chapter of uh, what would become Game of Thrones came to me. Uh, the Not the prologue, which is actually the first thing you read in a book, but the first proper chapter, which is the, the brand chapter where they find the dire wolf pups in, uh, in the summer snows. And that phrase, the summer snows, I knew they were summer snows. I knew there was something wrong with the seasons right away. And I could see the scene, but I didn't know what it was part of. I knew it wasn't part of the story I was writing, which was set on a, you know, thousand years in the future on a distant planet with spaceships and aliens. It wasn't part of that, clearly. This was a medieval fantasy. But it came to me so strongly and so powerfully that I put the other book aside. I've never returned to it. It's still moldering <laughs> in a drawer. And I started writing um, that first chapter. And I think the whole thing just poured out of me in about three days. So, and so it came to you for, as, as an image and the fragment of a phrase. So you got the picture of the direwolf. And the direwolf, the, the dead direwolf, the the puppies uh, are born, um, and the phrase that, that from a, from a dead mother, uh, you know, they, was she dying as they were born? Was she already dead as they came forth? I mean, there's that mystery: what killed her? What does this mean in a superstitious society where all these things are fraught with omens, and and you know, people believe that the gods, the old gods or the new gods, set all these things in motion. Um, and the characters, uh, you know, the fact that they were the pups were the exact same number and sex as the children of Lord Eddard Stark, uh, you know, which was a, the only thing that saved their life in that opening chapter, because otherwise uh, they, they were prepared to, to put the pups down. You make it sound like though someone handed you a piece of paper that said, here you go, here's, here's this picture of the, the dead die wolf and the pups, and here's this phrase, the paradoxical phrase, the summer snows. There you go, Deal, turn, turn that into fiction. It's, it's almost like that was handed to you. What, what do you think about that process? Yeah, I think it's a mystery. Um, it's the, the, the way the creative process works for myself and I think for many other writers is uh, something we don't really quite understand. Uh, you know, the ancient Greeks and Romans would talk about muses uh, coming down and uh, giving giving people these creative gifts. Um, 
later with Freud and Jung, we begin to talk about the id and the superego and the conscious and mind and the subconscious mind. Uh, in more recent decades, we talk about the right brain and the left brain, one of which is analytical, one of which is creative. I don't know which of these theories is true, but um, it, it does seem to me that sometimes the stories that I tell come from from somewhere else from a muse or from some part of my brain um that i don't have ready access to it's not like turning on a faucet or something it's it's they these ideas and characters and worlds seem to bubble out of nowhere and and you know you can't make them come you can't like sit there and say now i'm going to invent something today at least i can't you know, I've often talked about uh, two types of writers, uh, the, the gardeners and the architects. And uh, I, I think there are some novelists who are architects. They, they design their novels before they set a word down, like an architect building a house. You know, they know how many rooms are going to be in the house and what the square footage is going to be and how it sits on the land, how many stories it's going to be, how many where, where the electrical plugs are in each room, where the plumbing runs. The whole thing is down there in blueprints before they drive the first nail. And those writers, the whole book is laid out before they before they write the first sentence. Um, the gardener, on the other hand, digs a hole and he plants a seed and he, he waters it and you see what comes up and then you kind of shape it and work with it. Now, the gardener is not completely in the dark here. The gardener knows whether he planted a pomegranate or, or a or a lima bean, or uh, a weed, and sometimes weeds come up instead of the things you want to come up. But uh, but still, the gardener, it's a much more organic process. And I think there are very few pure architects or pure gardeners. I think most writers are combinations of the two, but the percentage differs, and I'm certainly much more of a gardener than I am an architect. And these ideas come to me, these characters come to me, and I set them in motion and follow where they lead. And it's it's not necessarily the most efficient way of writing. Sometimes it, it leads you down dead ends. You know, you, you find you've been writing a chapter or two chapters and boy, it leads nowhere, and you better go back and throw Pull the weeds out. <laughs> that's right, yeah. yeah. Um, mm. But... Um, you know, I've been at this uh, business since I sold my first story in 1971, my first professional sale. So I've been at this a long time, and it's worked pretty well for me. So I'm not about to change it at this point in time. I'll uh, continue to follow my characters wherever they lead me. <laughs> I like the delicious feeling of uncertainty I get in your work. For a long time into Game of Thrones, when I st you start with Game of Thrones, I, there was a point I paused almost towards the end where I thought, is is the magic that people are talking about actually real in this book? Because it's a long while before you see anything truly supernatural happen, like dragons are born. You see, there are white walkers, but you know, you think that that, that might not be as supernatural as it seems. You, the, super, the supernatural world really creeps in very subtly at the edges of the world. And you've got gods in the book as well. Old gods, the new gods, uh, the Lord of Light. How real are the gods? Uh, is it giving too much away to say how real the gods are in the world of Westeros? Well, I don't, how real are the gods in our world? Um, a lot of people believe they're real. A lot of people have very intense faith in them, and uh, there are people who will swear that, uh, you know, prayer works and certain prophets, uh, be it Jesus or Muhammad or uh, whoever, could work miracles and raise the dead and walk on water and, you know, what have you. Um, are, are those things real or are those things myths? Um, we don't know, and I... I, I Although my work is fantasy and it's set in an imaginary world, I want to ground it in realism. I, I look at the real world and I look at real history and I, I draw from that uh, for my parallels to hopefully give it the same sort of uh, verisimilitude there. I certainly don't intend ever to bring a god on stage in any of the ah. Ice and Fire books where a god will certainly suddenly appear. Like a genie uh, or something, yeah. Yeah, uh, there's fantasy that does that, but um, it, it, not mine because, again... The grounding in realism here, I, I don't I don't really see that happening in, in real life. I mean, we see events happening in, in the real world that certain people who have a religious uh, belief ascribe to their particular god or combination of gods, but it's not provable that it was that. It could have just been 
some other explanation. And that's, I, I like that sort of ambiguity since it occurs in real life. I, I want to create that ambiguity in my fiction too. So, you know, when something happens and some of my characters are very cynical about the gods, be they the old gods or new gods, but there are other people who are deeper, deeply religious and have a lot of uh, faith. And, you know, there's a, there's a priest as one of the characters who follows a, a deity called the Drowned God. There's Melisandre, who's a, um, a priestess of, um, of a fire deity, the, uh, the Lord of Light. Um, and they're, you know, they're true believers. Uh, they ascribe everything to the gods. Other characters like uh, Tyrion Lannister are far more cynical about all of this. One of the interesting things about the way I've structured the books, uh, you know, I have multiple viewpoint characters. It's a tight viewpoint structure where uh, I'm not an omniscient author. I don't tell you the way it really is. I put you in the skin of uh, one of my characters, and you're seeing the world through that character, and you're hearing his thoughts, but you only know what he knows. You only see what he sees. You only hear what he hears. Uh, and it's all filtered through his own particular worldview and beliefs. Um, so George R. R. Martin is not a god in the uh, Song of Ice and Fire in that sense? Not in that sense, no. Well, your voice isn't anyway, not the voice of the god. And sometimes two characters who are present at the same event have very different versions of that uh -huh. same event, of course, as you as you find in the real world. Uh, you know, any, any trial attorney will tell you if you get two eyewitnesses, you get two different versions of what actually occurred. Um, so... You know, I try to include all of that in, in the books. There's a lot of moral anarchy going on in Westeros at the time. You know, the wicked tend to get on pretty well, and good men, like, you know, Ned Stark, die like dogs. Is is that how things... Is it a particularly bad time in Westeros when you're writing, in your mind? Or is this how things always are in this medieval world? Well, you know, I'm actually at the moment, one of the projects I'm working on is a, is a sort of a history of Westeros called The World of Ice and Fire that we hope to have out next year. It's going to be a huge uh, coffee table book um, with a lot of gorgeous art by wow. some of the top fantasy illustrators in the world. And it's going to have a lot of the backstory, the history that I've worked out that I haven't included. And while working on it, I've, I've fleshed out some of that history considerably. So, uh, you know, I think you, you look through... The history of Westeros, and there are there are periods of peace and prosperity, um, but then it's it's not like this is the first time they've ever had a civil war, or the first time they've ever had uh, these sort of political machinations and murders and poisonings and so forth. That's, there's, there's that occurs all through history, just as it does all through real history. There, there is such an absence of justice. It seems specifically. Is this the time, though? Is this is this how it is? Is this part of winter is coming? Is this, this is the kind of climate setting, the kind of moral climate in the world? Well, um, first of all, the story is not finished. Of course, the ice yeah. and fire story. So we'll have to see where things stand at the end of it. But um, you know, I've I've drawn a lot on real history. Um, I've twisted it and turned it and, you know, added fantasy elements and combined elements of it. But still, the grounding is in real history and particularly medieval history, the Wars of the Roses, the Crusades, the uh, the Albigensian Crusade, um, the Hundred Years' War. And if you look through those periods, uh, you you don't see a lot of uh, what you would call justice there either. either. You see... Uh, um, unending successions of, of murders and battles and l people lying to each other and betraying each other and, uh, um, you know, all this, all this, uh, human drama being played out with, uh, with crowns in the hazard and, uh, life and death on the line. I, I notice, uh, that, uh, given the, uh, the medieval flavor of these books. I just wonder if you'd like to kind of imagine yourself what life would have been like in the Middle Ages with, you know, where most people's lives, they wouldn't have got wanted much beyond their own village. The only thing they'd hear all day would be bird song or wind through the trees. The only image they'd ever see would be an icon in church at the end of the week. Is that something you try to try to think about when you're writing? Well, I'd, I'd certainly try to keep, uh, you know, what I know about the, the real Middle Ages in, in mind. It is fantasy, so I could change elements, but I think you have to be very careful when you change things. You have to you have to think about every change you make. You can't do it. I, I mean, I read a lot of fantasy, too, and I, I, I love fantasy when it's done right. Uh, there's a lot of it that's not done right that 
while they adopt the trappings of the Middle Ages, it's sort of a, a Disneyland Middle Ages where they have castles and princesses and knights, but they don't. It's there's no depth there. It's it's very uh, shallow. Um, yeah, the real Middle Ages was a tough time to live. I, I mean, you know, the historians have, especially the early Middle Ages, historians have moved away from calling it the Dark Ages, as we used to call it, which I think is a pity because the Dark Ages were a better name for it than the early Middle Ages, which is one of these, you know, politically correct things. We don't want to offend any of our Dark Age people, but uh, they were pretty Dark Ages. Yeah. And uh, yes, there was some, there was the church, which was a civilizing influence, and there were some things left over from the Roman Empire, which had fallen. But generally speaking, life in the Dark Ages was nasty and and barbaric and short, and certainly a lot less pleasant than it had been during the Roman era that had preceded it, which had been a far more civilized era with, with you know, better government and better hygiene and, um, you know, more of the trappings of what we would consider the civilization. Uh, when the Roman Empire fell, the human race really did go back, um, or at least Western. I mean, let's let's be clear here that um, there were things going on in, in the Americas and in Africa and in, certainly in Asia where, where Chinese completely unrelated to what was happening during the Dark Ages in, in Western Europe. But still, the Dark Ages were bad period and then we climbed out of it into the into the middle ages but it was still a difficult time there was you know the black death would come along every once in a while and kill three quarters of the people and uh, the systems of justice and and uh, were primitive and and did not really work for many people i mean if, if there was the class system um had real teeth. If you were a lord, you could get away with all sorts of rape and murder on on people of lower classes, uh, you know, peasants and serfs and things like that. Um, they they didn't have much appeal in practicality. They may have had certain rights in theory, but try to exercise them and. It was very difficult. It was a period of uh, there were frequent famines and starvation, and uh, most people were illiterate. Um, the the serfs were in the early ages were attached to the land, and even when they weren't attached to the land, they lived and died in their own little village. Like the next village three miles down the road was like a foreign country to them. Let alone the only time they really got to see the world is when there was a war. And it was, I think one of the reasons that people, at least at first, eagerly would sign up when the king said, "Hey, let's we're going to go to France and have war against the Frenchmen." And hey, well, get to see France and maybe get some plunder and you know, get out of this planting the turnips and harvesting the turnips. Yeah, and no wonder the, the Crusades turnips. were so popular. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, a lot of your characters seem very lonely uh, to me in the book. Do you think we're all a bit like that? Uh, sure. <laughs> I think that's, uh, maybe that's just my worldview, but there's a certain existential loneliness. I, we're all trapped in our own, in our own heads. I, you know, I, in my early work, uh, long before Ice and Fire, I wrote science fiction, uh, from the seventies. Um, and, uh, I had a story, my first Hugo and, uh, Nebula award winner, the song for Laia, um, was about telepathy, and uh, that was always an interesting issue to explore in science fiction was what if you could really know uh, another human being, you know, what if you could read their minds, not just some treatments of telepathy, it's just like silent conversation where, you know, you're just reading thoughts that people are sending to you, but what if you could really go in someone's head and know all their secrets, know everything about them, every good thing about them, every shameful thing about them, all the all the uh, fears that they have, all the desires that they have, all of the the terrible things that they've done or wish they'd done or 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 dreams? Would you would it make you love other people more? Would there be total acceptance if you had total knowledge of another person, or? Would you go mad? Would yeah. would you hate yeah. everybody else? And would they all hate you? Because we would all see. I mean, we're all these complex combinations of uh, of good and evil. Um, but we have walls that we erect, and we we only show other people the things that we want them to see. And there's a certain existential loneliness, you know, because of the very nature of that. Tyrion Lannister, the uh, dwarf character in Game of Thrones and in the Song of Ice and Fire is, I don't know, for me and for many, many, many others, for just about everyone, I think it's probably everyone's favourite character in 
game in uh, Game of Thrones and in the Song of Ice and Fire. And he has this really memorable moment where he says, I have a tender spot in my heart for cripples and bastards and broken things. So many, many of your characters, some of your characters are these outsiders. They're either different or they're disabled in some way like him. And they seem to be the only characters that are capable of true compassion. And yet they seem to suffer for it. Now they, it's... Is this something you're conscious of doing, George, as you're writing the book? Yeah, definitely. I mean, yes, I have a large cast of viewpoint characters, but but uh, for the most part, they all have something that makes them a, a bit of an outcast. You know, Tyrion is a is a dwarf. Uh, Jon Snow is a bastard, uh, and Danny, who's you know beautiful, is a penniless exile um, who's being essentially sold off in in marriage you know Arya is is uh, born to a noble house um, but she's kind of the wild child who she doesn't conform with her proper gender roles Brienne of Tarth even more doesn't conform to her proper gender roles and because of that she suffers a lot of scorn and and rejection because she's not a proper woman in in the terms of her society um, Sam Tar- Tarly is is fat and bookish when a lord is expected to be warlike and strong and fierce and good with a sword and Sam is pawn would rather read and dance and listen to music and so he suffers a lot of rejection and I could go on and on uh, but you know all of those people you're talking have this honor code as well uh, they're the characters who have an honor code within themselves that they almost need to hide right and and that seems to make life even more difficult for them in the world of Westeros. Even even a character like Theon Greyjoy, who's uh, not a character that a lot of people are fond of, because um, he's a weak character. Um, I mean, he's physically strong. He's he's very skilled with a bow. He's uh, you know a good warrior. Um, but he's he's a a character who's suffering a lot of confusion about his place in the world because, you know, he's born of a noble family, but his father raised a rebellion, and his elder brothers were killed during that rebellion, and he was handed over as a hostage at the end, theoretically a ward they called it, but still a hostage. If his father creates trouble, he's to be hung. You know, so that was a frequent practice in the Middle Ages when you didn't really trust one of your underlords or an enemy who had bent the knee. You took some of his children as wards or hostages and um so he he called he he's a great joy by birth and uh by some standards he's the heir to to the iron islands but he's been raised in the household of Eddard stark and just part of him who you know he has these two fathers looming over him neither one who, who he can ever quite please and he's desperate to find his place in the world as one or the other but from that confusion a great drama arises you know i mean i think the best fiction the best stories arise out of uh conflict i've always taken as my my mantra um william, william faulkner's nobel prize acceptance speech where he said the only thing worth writing about is the human heart and conflict with itself and uh I think that's true of all fiction, whether it's science fiction or fantasy or literary fiction or mystery fiction. The human heart in conflict with itself, the characters who are having problems, um, who are trying to decide the right thing to do, who are trying to make some sense of their life, who are trying to find their place in the world or or any of these issues. These, these are what make characters real. These are the things that real people do and... and um, that's the characters I love to read about. Those are the characters I love to write about. I mentioned earlier that so far, Song of Ice and Fire isn't following the hero's journey. It doesn't seem to be anyway. I wonder, are you consciously trying to discard that that old trope? Or do you feel still obliged to write within that thing? The heroes you know, go out to the world, they meet I've, challenges. I've never g- the given it much thought one way or the other. Um, Really? I mean, this is this is kind of a no, known template in Hollywood. Yeah. You've been a screenwriter. You would have been hit over the head with it many times, I would have thought. Yeah, but it doesn't interest me. You know, I, I read a lot of books. I get books sent to me all the time for blurbing. And, of course, I've been a voracious reader since I was a small child. And uh, one of the things that I learned... Um, when I was still a small child and a high school kid, was that there would be certain patterns in in uh, um, storytelling. 
that were very predictable, and I began to predict them. And I very quickly, even as a teenager, I lost interest in the predictable stories, the stories that went exactly where I wanted to uh, wanted to go. You know, we were we were talking uh, a little before the show about uh, our shared past in comic books. Yeah. Uh, you know, I my my first. First things mine ever published were letters in in the comic books of the uh, Marvel comic books of the early 1960s, the Avengers and and uh, Fantastic Four and Spider Man and Me so too. forth. Um, I was very impressed with those, and I was born in 1948, so I started reading comics in the 50s, just around the time that the Silver Age began. The crime comics and horror comics were going out. Superheroes were coming back after uh, like a decade's absence. And at first they came back with DC with uh, Julius Schwartz editing and characters like uh, The Flash and Green Lantern and uh, the Justice League were brought back in new incarnations. And I loved these comics, but they were very predictable. It was, you know, The Flash was a good guy. Green Lantern was a good guy. Uh, the Atom was a good guy. Hawkman was a good guy. They were all good guys, and every issue they fought a bad guy. And the bad guys weren't terribly bad in the 50s. They were mostly guys trying to rob banks. But they were just, uh, you know, they were they were bad guys. They were criminals, and uh, the, the hero would catch them by the end of the book. And then next issue, there would be another bad guy who was trying to take over the world or trying to rob a bank or trying to get revenge, and uh, the hero would stop him. And then... Marvel came along and with Stan Lee writing, and uh, that was you know the first times I was writing letters and getting them published, and it was so revolutionary to me. It's it's hard to looking back for people who weren't there to conceive of how shocking these comics were because Stan Lee threw out the rules. I mean, with the Fantastic Four, the character of the Thing, he was a monster. He he looked like the early Marvel monster comics. He was like made of orange rocks, and he had a ferocious temper. And he he didn't want to be the thing. He was like this tragic hero, and he would go into rages, and he would fight with uh, Mr. Fantastic, Mr. Or, Fantastic, or, or, Fantastic or, yeah. In the early issues, he had a thing for Sue Storm too, and he and Reed Richards mm-hmm. were both interested in the same girl. That never happened at DC, you know. Superman had Lois Lane, you know. You never saw Batman hitting on Lois Lane. <laughs> Batman had his own his own girlfriend, you <laughs> know. The, my Flash, mind, the, very the <laughs> Flash had his own girlfriend, you know. People didn't. Everything was was very much in order in DC, and over in in Marvel, it was it was just chaos. Characters who didn't like each other, characters who didn't want to be heroes. And then, like, one of the early letters I, I had printed was uh, the an issue of The Avengers where a character called Wonder Man was introduced. And he was this great new hero, Wonder Man, and he, he joined The Avengers. But he seemed to be a good guy, but he was actually a bad guy who had been sent to undermine The Avengers. But at the end, he turned out to be a good guy because he couldn't go through it being a bad guy. And he died in the same issue. This great new hero died in the same issue as he was introduced. It had a tremendous impact on me. It was, it was like Stan. Stanley was saying, no one is safe. Anything can happen in these books. You know, all of these things are off the off the table. Now, of course, it was comics. They brought him back, you know, a couple of years later. But uh, still, the fact that he died, it was a, it was a tragic story here. And the, the thing coming to that, as a 13 and 14-year-old, I was tremendously impressed with that. And I've always remained impressed with, uh, with stories where you don't know what was going to happen. I mean... Um, no one is safe. Anything can happen. Yes, and Tolkien, you know, in some ways led the way for that. I mean, the, the Fellowship of the Ring set out, and, you know, the death of Boromir had enormous impact on me. And then the seeming death of Gandalf, uh, you know, that incredible moment in, in a Fellowship of the Ring where, where the Balrog drags Gandalf down into the abyss, and you think he's dead. You think he's dead for, you know, a good part of the rest of that book and the first part of the next book. Um if it had been me, I probably would have let him stay dead uh, because the impact of losing Gandalf, Gandalf was the leader. He was the one who knew what was going to happen. He was the, the father figure, the wise guy. He, he he always could tell you what to do and what was the meaning of this. And now it was like the children are yeah. in charge. The, the Father's the, dead. Father's dead. Yeah. What are you going to do now? Yeah. Now you have to save the world. Oh, God, what a feeling that was. And, you know, that set me up perfectly for then the end of uh, uh, the second book, The Two Towers, when it seems as though Frodo is dead. 
that Frodo's been stung by Shelob, and Sam takes the ring, and he leaves Frodo, and I was this reeling and saying, my God, they've killed, I thought Frodo was a hero, they've killed Frodo, how could he do this, you know, and I really didn't know what was going to happen at the end of that book, and that's the feelings that I had reading those things are the feelings that I try to uh, replicate uh, for for my readers. So there you are reading comics as a kid in the what late 50s, early 60s thereabouts. What part of America was this, George? I grew up uh, born and raised in Bayonne, New Jersey, which is uh, a, a blue-collar industrial town right outside New York City, right across the uh, New York Bay from uh, New York City. How close were you to the the, the docks, the shipping uh, area around there? Well, Bayonne's a peninsula, so nobody is ever far. I was right across the street from uh, the Kilvan Cole, which is the deep water channel that connects New York Bay and Newark Bay. I could see the, the big uh, big freighters going back and forth uh, day and night down the Kilvan Cole under the Bayonne Bridge. Uh, and with a kid with a vivid imagination, what did that do? How did that stimulate your, uh, your imagination? Well, it was... You know, we had no money. We were we, we lived in the federal housing projects, so uh, my world was a very small world. Um, I lived on First Street. I went to school in a school on Fifth Street, so my world was five blocks long. You know, occasionally I would take fifteen cents and take the bus up to Twenty Fifth Street to go to uh, the movie theaters there. But uh, mostly, I lived in those five blocks, uh, walking everywhere since we had no car. But I would see these ships going and, and, and all the flags, you know, flags from Scandinavia and, and China and uh, Japan and Liberia and... Uh, Australia, maybe. Have, well, yeah, <laughs> maybe Australia, yeah. yeah. And dream about uh, visiting those places. And, of course, um, the only way I did visit anywhere was in the pages of books, books and comic books, uh, science fiction and fantasy, which took me to... Um, not only to Australia and, and Singapore, but uh, took me to other planets, to Barsoom and, and Trantor and Middle Earth. Uh, I could go anywhere I wanted in the pages of a book. I think you said in the past that uh, the movie Forbidden Planet made a big impact on you as a kid. Oh, I love Forbidden Planet. It's still my favorite science fiction movie. I just showed it. at the, It was the first movie. I bought a movie theater uh, six months ago in uh, a little uh, art house cinema in, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, the Jean Cocteau. It's uh, built in 1984, closed in 2006 when the chain that owned it went under. Um, so we reopened it in August, and Forbidden Planet was the first film I showed. It's such an important film, isn't it? The, the whole, the, based on the Tempest, Shakespeare's Tempest, and, and the monster. The monster, so it might even be the scariest monster ever to be in a... In, in a science fiction film, perhaps, even even compared to Alien in some ways. Well, it was, yeah. yes. I mean, it, of course, you see it today, and the film is from 1956, so it's it's primitive uh, special effects compared to what we do today. But for the time being, uh, for, for, for its time, the it was special effects were state-of-the-art and beyond. It was, they had Robbie the Robot, and the, the monster from the id, when he appears in the blaster beams, was, was an amazing creation. You just get a glimpse of him, and it's this terrifying thing, and the, the sound and all of that was cool. But even more than the appearance of the monsters, there were a lot of scary monsters in, in science fiction films of, of the time. Um, you know, mostly giant bugs or, yeah. you know, Godzilla and all the that. Blob. The, the, mm. the, the Blob. The Blob was pretty scary, actually. It was. That, yeah. that, was a, that was a pretty cool film, The Blob, the original Blob, um, with Stephen McQueen, his first role. He was like a 34-year-old th- playing a teenager. Yeah, he's, he's, he's got lines <laughs> he goes, Dad, you've got to believe me, I saw a monster. <laughs> <laughs> um but but the blob, you know, was a creature from outer space and these other things. Like Godzilla was a lizard. It got radioactive and all that. And the great thing about the monster from the Eden Forbidden Planet is it is it came from inside what was basically a, a, a good man, you know, Morbius, uh, Doctor Morbius. You know, the the it was a monster from the id. It destroyed an entire civilization. The Krell, after a million years of shining sanity, the Krell could scarcely have imagined what was destroying them. And it's true. We all have these monsters inside us, you know. If the, if the great Krell machine was really built on Earth, I have no doubt that we would destroy ourselves within, within hours. I mean, look at the things that people do in the world even to this day with, uh, you know, wars and murders and suicide bombers. And, you know, there's so many people who have... Uh, um, monsters inside us. So isn't the lesson of Forbidden Planet that you, you can't deny it? You can build this kind of world on rationality and science and one side of the brain, 
but if you pretend you've extinguished the the madness, the other side of the brain, the emotional, the creative, the darker, the, you know, the, the moon as opposed to the sun of the side of the brain, and, then they're going to create monsters that'll bash uh, down your metal door. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's we're all we're all uh, partly beast, the mindless primitive, as they say in that the. Uh, you know, governed by passions, by lust and fear and rage, um, you know. And for many of us, um, these things are never expressed, you know. I, I, I think some of the criminals in our society and some of the people suffering insanity basically lose their power to repress their darker feelings. But the rest of us, you know, we suffer these moments of, of uh anger at someone where we you know we have this flash of we want to we would love to kill them or something or moments of lust and all that and it just it it passes our civilized thing damps it down and you know we kick the wall instead of mm-hmm. kicking in our boss's head or <laughs> or smashing our rival with an axe but uh uh, if we had a machine that instantly translated all of our desires, our mental desires, into tangible reality, um, you know, it would be a pretty nightmarish there would 24 be, hours. There would be yeah. nothing left yeah. <laughs> at the end of it either, would there? No. no. I think you said you were about five or six when you started writing stories. Do you remember what they were about, George? Uh, monster stories. I think I was a little older. Than, well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it was about that. I still have one of the earliest things I wrote, which was an encyclopedia. I was writing like nonfiction encyclopedia of space, and uh, basically it was I was drawing too. So I would draw a circle on uh, each each planet got its own page. So I would draw up like a circle and color it red and write Mars on top. And Mars is the red planet; it has canals and stuff. But I was mixing real planets like Mars and Venus with planets I saw on shows like Flash Gordon and Rocky Jones Space <laughs> Ranger. You know, so it would be Mars on one page and Zongo on another page. <laughs> <laughs> so there's this kind of desire to create whole well, universes there, isn't there? You yeah. this, uh, this to build a, a kind of a universe and then people it with, with, with things. You, and an exotic universe. I, yeah. I, I've always been drawn to uh, exotic exoticism, which in some circles has become a dirty word these days. Uh, the, people don't like to be called exotic, but... Uh, um, you know, I, I crave the exotic and, and I finally got to travel, you know, I, I had that little five, five block world when I was a kid, but as I've become successful, I have traveled to, to Australia and to all over Europe and, uh, a little bit to Africa, the, to Morocco and all that. And it's been very amazing on one hand, but there are times I feel, uh, and I've almost lived too late because it's, and it's probably the fault of my own country or uh, Western civilization in general. But like everywhere I go, I find a Starbucks, and uh, yeah. you know, it's where's the? I don't, I don't want to go to Morocco and find a Starbucks. I, I, I want to. I mean, maybe the people want to. People of Morocco actually want us. They want that. This is the but, I went, but, when I went to Morocco. I turned on the TV and got the Cartoon Network, and I went. Oh, I don't want to. I don't want to see the Cartoon Network in Morocco. <laughs> yes. No. No. But they wanted it. Well, some of them do. I don't know. But you know, it's, uh, yeah, I know what you mean. It's 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 like uh, you, you know, you're you're craving. I, I mean, we both have the same things. I, I I have to admit, I see the contradictions in, inherently in myself. I I go to I go to a distant country country, and I want to I want a nice comfortable five star hotel with with room service and yeah, yeah. Uh, and all of that stuff but i also want the exotic bazaars and the strange music and the foods that i've never tasted before and and uh, you know i i want something different and the worlds of imagination science fiction and fantasy are you know places where the exotic has lived for a long time and one of the hands of writers like jack vance and robert silverberg and uh, you know some of the great Great writers, uh, world builders, uh, Tolkien and, and all that, you know, it was, I mean, the Shire where, where Tolkien begins Lord of the Rings, um, I suppose the Shire is very homey and familiar to someone like Tolkien himself who grew up in an English pastoral kind of 19th century setting but to a urban kid from Bayonne, new jersey even the shire was wildly exotic people living in holes and you know going to inns and all of that is pretty wild and then as you get out in lord of the rings the world gets stranger and stranger and you have these wonderful places like the mines of moria and lothlorien and and um you know, Rivendell and Minas Tirith, the Towers of Minas Tirith. I want to see all those places. See, I want I, to visit all of them. I think your work is fundamentally, categorically different from Tolkien because Tolkien doesn't have politics. 
Right. The Shire is envisaged as this place where no politics exists. There's no political tension, really, there. It's this kind of settled state that's kind of perfect. And then wickedness comes into the world, which comes from one land, and it infects the rest of the world. Whereas politics you're, in your world is everywhere, which is what life is like, of course. So there is always, but there are always political tensions. There is a little politics in Tolkien. I mean, to be fair here, the, even in the Shire, uh, you know, at the end, the scouring of the Shire, you know, where the Shire becomes corrupted, it's, it's Saruman comes in under the guise of Sharky, and he corrupts some of the local hobbits who want power, like the Sackville Bagginses. And, yeah, and, and but something. without Saruman, it wouldn't be politicized. <laughs> you see, it takes. You see, normally the hobbits are fine; they're right. beyond politics. They don't. They don't. You know, they squabble, but there's no real serious political difficulty, is there? That's the thing. Uh, yeah, I suppose that's true. You have also a politics in uh, in Gondor, where the the stewards don't want to give way to the true kings. They they that's true. They've been that's stewards true. for so yeah. long that uh, they 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 don't what king you know what king went away thousands of years ago. We're not uh, going for that. But it, it's true that it's minimal. And and Tolkien, um, I don't know if he actually subscribed to it, but certainly Lord of the Rings in, endorses this. Uh, f- thing that you see in a lot of fantasy, which is the belief that a a good man will be a good king, um, mm-hmm. which is a reassuring belief that we would have. Uh, we, we like to think that uh, the leaders that we support are good men and the leaders that we oppose are maybe less good men or in some cases bad men because they have bad policies. But if you actually look at history, it's far more, you know, you can't just say, and, and then Aragorn became king and ruled wisely for a thousand years. You know, I want to know, okay, what what were Aragorn's policies as king? You know, what was his taxation policy? Yeah. How did he, how did he handle times of famine and things like that? What what did he do when two lords? How did he handle the orc problem? I mean, yeah, exactly. And, and he's a hundred thousands of orcs left over at the end of the war. Did he, did he campaign on a policy of genocide? Yeah. Let's just find Ethnic all cleansing of the orcs. orcs. Yes. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, 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 you know, given he was so sullen and withdrawn, how did he persuade anyone to come <laughs> along with whatever project he was trying to achieve? And, uh, yeah, who died and made him king anyway, as they say. As, as they, as they say. So, so I've seen, you know, st- studying history, um, you know, you see great kings who are actually seem to be pretty loathsome people, but they, they're they smart in terms of the policies that they adopt and they produce certain prosperity for their kingdoms. And you even see this in the present day. I mean, certainly uh, in, in America, the in my lifetime, I think the best man ever to be president was Jimmy Carter. I, I mean, if you look at Jimmy Carter's life, here's a man who's very intelligent, you know, very um, caring and, and compassionate, uh, wanted to do the right thing and everything. But he was a failure as a president. He was not a good president. I voted for him the first time and, and had to go to a third-party candidate this when he ran for re-election. Have you seen that episode he, of The Simpsons where they erect a statue of Jimmy Carter in Springfield and people scream and they go, he's history's greatest monster, and the <laughs> town erupts into rioting? No, I, I missed that one. I missed that one. But it's just the proof. It's not enough mm. to be a good man to be a to be a good king. You need some, guile, don't you? Yes. Well, you need something. It, it's a process of making decisions, and sometimes you you get very. I mean, you know, you look at somebody like Lyndon Baines Johnson. Uh, you know, another, another president of my lifetime. Um, his war on poverty, his dream of the Great Society, is a very idealistic dream. Yeah, some conservatives might say, "Well, it was all wrong. It was socialist and all that," but. Putting that debate aside, um, if he could have succeeded in that, he would be remembered like uh, LBJ and then the New Deal and, uh, you know, uh, like FDR and the New Deal and all that. Um, that was his idea to complete the New Deal and to produce a society without poverty and want. Um, but then he got sidetracked by the Vietnam War, and it completely destroyed his administration and destroyed him, him I think, and destroyed his historical reputation. So you're trying to do good things on the one hand, and on the other hand, you, you get dragged into this war and you make a number of the wrong decisions. Um, I guess the that's a very long way of saying it's hard to be the king or the president. It's hard to know the right thing to do, and there are unintended consequences to every decision that you make. And you know, people rise up in opposition whose ox is being gored, and and uh, 
this stuff fascinates me, and I'd love to write about it. So it's very much a part of uh, of Westeros. Uh, the decisions are not easy, like do the good thing and do the bad thing. If you do the, sometimes if you do the good thing, there's going to be lots of nasty consequences to you and yours. So maybe you should do the bad thing or try to figure out some third thing to do. And I want to grapple with all of that. So yeah, politics is is definitely part of it. What do you think of that edict? Write about what you know. That writer's edict that's told to everyone who goes to writing school, write about what you know. I mean, there'd be no Game of Thrones if that were true, wouldn't it? You know, yes and no. Um, when I was uh, when I first heard that, when I was a young writer as a kid and I heard that, I was very um, troubled by that comment because uh, I didn't want to just write about a kid growing up in the projects. I wanted to write about other worlds. I wanted to write science fiction and, and fantasy. Um I didn't want to write autobiographical fiction, but I, I think as I have gotten older and I got a little deeper understanding of writing, and uh, I think there's great truth to that, but it doesn't have to be taken literally. It doesn't mean that if you're, you know, raised in, if you're born and raised in Brisbane, you can only write about some kid being born and raised in Brisbane in the 70s. I know. Or what would it be if you just wrote about New Jersey in the it, 60s? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, it would be. I mean, that's a valid thing to do. There, there are some yeah. writers who are who are terrific at that. Um, we're, we're about in my, my Jean Cocteau Theater. We have authors in, too. And as soon as I get back from this trip, uh, we're having Pat Conroy in, amazing writer, one of the great American writers of our time, I think. And his work is hugely autobiographical. He, he's uh, almost everything he writes. You can see the specter of his abusive father in, in it. Um, you know, the great Santini, uh, his new book is The Death of Santini, but even in things like Prince of Tides and all that, um, and that's great. You know, you can, you can do that, but you can also do the other thing. And certainly my, my life, the things I know, um, do give my fiction its power. You know, there's, there's a lot of me in Tyrion Lannister. There's a lot of me in Samuel Tarly or even in characters like Arya or, or Daenerys, uh, you know, feelings I've had, ways of looking at the world. And, and what you know doesn't always mean what you've experienced, too. I know a lot of things because I've read about them in books, because I've studied history, because I've studied literature and, uh, you know, read all of the great writers who have gone before me. That's stuff I know, too. So when write what you know, those are things I know, and it's all grist for the mill. How about the other dictum, which is to find, for a writer, you should find the area of your greatest pain and write about that? Uh, yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> Who said of? that? <laughs> oh, I don't know. That's something that's been floating around for a while, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and that, 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 way, that way, when you're, you're most, a friend of mine said this, you're most vulnerable. That's when you're most at, at your strongest in a funny way as a writer. Well, I, yes, I think that's true. Um, you know, you, there's a question of writing from the, writing from the head or writing from the heart. Uh, and I think great literature is written from the heart, or some people would say it's written from the guts or the balls or wherever you want. But but it 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 has you know writing fiction in particular is about emotion. You sometimes see science fiction called the literature of ideas, but really, if you want to argue ideas, write essays, write nonfiction. That's the best thing to do ideas. Uh, to express an idea and weigh arguments. Um, fiction is about emotion. You know, you can write an anti-slavery tract, um, as many abolitionists did in the uh, in the 1840s and the 1850s, but if you really want to make a case of slavery, you write Uncle Tom's Cabin, and you punch people in the in the gut, and you make it, you create characters, and you make an emotional case. That's what that's what fiction is all about, the emotions. I'm just going to go out now by playing uh, a track from an Australian group called Axis of Awesome. It's had to be heavily abridged, I'm afraid, George, because of <laughs> language reasons and still a uh, language warning now. You may still be offended nonetheless. I've pulled out certain words, but this is uh, kind of about how intense your fans are. This is a song called Rage of Thrones from Axis of Awesome. George, thank you so much for being my guest. Oh, my pleasure. You got a new favourite show? Been watching HBO. You got a new favorite show? Been watching HBO. You got a new favorite show? Been watching HBO. You got a new favorite show? It's called Game of Thrones. Well, I read the fucking books. I read them years ago. Don't tell me about Jon Snow Cause I already know I've got a signed copy 
been listening to a podcast of conversations with Richard Feidler. For more information and interviews, visit abc.net.au slash conversations.